on Wednesday, this Wednesday at 6 p.m., the Kingdom Care Connect Group will have a second run of its review in Show and Tell Zoom. You'll hear a little bit more about that later from later, Rashonda, as we continue to talk about how we are relaunching and rebuilding our Grace Youth Ministry Connect Groups. But for those who are in our youngest age group, zero to four, we will have a review, but there will be no Bible study in the 7 p.m. hour, virtual or in person, because as you all know, in the summer months, we often pull back on Wednesdays in June and July because of vacation and travel, just to give you an opportunity to breathe. But it doesn't mean we had been active. We've had our worship on Wednesday, Vacation Bible School, a wonderful Vacation Bible School community fun day on yesterday. So we've been active, and so these are opportunities for us to just kind of let us maintain a little ministry life balance. Amen. Amen. On Saturday, we're going to be here uh, for consecration prayer. It, it, this year feels like it's moving so fast. And it's already going to be the first Saturday of the month. So we'll be here in the sanctuary. Or if you want to dial in, you can do that from 10 to 11. Praying that God will bless us like never before. Not just for communion worship, but just period. We need to be blessed. Prayer is not just about talking to God, but it's about letting God speak back to you. And then again, ongoing our Gym Connect groups and it's their formation and establishment. You will hear a little bit more about that. We wanted to give emphasis to that today because it is Youth Sunday. And we want to make sure that the way we are trying to minister to our young people is clearly understood by all of the parents, grandparents, guardians, because it's really, really important. I said this a couple of Sundays ago. A church without young people is a pitiful church. It's a pitiful church. We've got to understand that our time with them is finite. And before you know it, those years will have passed by. It is our responsibility to be proactive in putting the word of God in them. It is our responsibility to show them the way of church life and kingdom life. Amen. Now, what do I mean? Church life is all about getting into that regimen, making sure they see this as a priority. But secondly, they need to understand that serving God is be bigger and broader than even a Sunday service. And how they serve Christ and represent him outside of these walls is equally important. Those are our announcements. Our call to worship says to sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Sing praises on the harp to our God. Now, you may not be a singer, but I'm sure you're thankful. So I want you to get a memory or two or three or a thousand on your mind about what God has done for you. And I want to hear our thanksgiving this morning. Amen. I want to hear us give our thanksgiving. Sing praises on the harp to our God. You might not play a harp. You may not play a piano. But if Sister Rashonda can play that air guitar during praise and worship, I know you can do something. You can put your hands together. You can shout us to God with a voice of triumph. You can say, Lord, I love you. Lord, I thank you. Lord, I praise you. Lord, I give you the glory. You're awesome. You're wonderful. You're magnificent. You're holy. You're righteous. <laughs>
praises and all of our youth that have been on program. Let's give them a round of applause. are restructuring our youth department now known as Jim Grace Youth Ministry and we are so so excited about that. So far we've excited about the successful relaunch of two teams. Since April we've been working with the Kingdom Care Connect Group ages 0 to 4. Parents who registered their children received an electronic toolkit filled with activity sheets and videos for the month. On the last Wednesday of each month at 6 o'clock p.m., these youth and parents join for a 20-minute show-and-tell review via Zoom. This team also helps the care of our little ones during Sunday worship service. Thanks to the team members, Sister Melanie, Sister Latonia, Sister Maya, and Sister Megan, also Sister Chantel, who's been working remotely. So let's give them a hand of applause. The second team is the Sunshine Man Connect Group for ages 5 through 10. This group meets on Wednesdays from 6 to 6.50 p.m. with a weekly Bible lesson. For now, we're doing this over Zoom, but we will move to a hybrid format after the summer. Thanks to the team members, Sister Kristen, Sister Tam, Sister Bria, Sister Lori, who is leading this effort. We thank God for them. In July, we'll be working to establish Airborne and Rooted Connect groups for youth ages 10 and up based on their level of knowledge. Please help us by keeping your youth connected. At this time, it is time to hear a word of from the Lord. And I don't know about you, but I need a word from the Lord. And we have a very, very capable leader, our pastor, Pastor Brandon Smith, who will come up and break the bread of life. Before he comes, we have another awesome youth that will be coming up with the song of preparation. Right. None other than Brother William. Brother Will is going to come on up. Brother Will Robinson, and let's give him a clap. I am so excited. This little brother has been asking to sing. Will, we 
we love you too. Yeah. As you know, I have been, we have been walking 
through the word of God, walking through the word of scripture, refreshing ourselves on this year of love. 2021, God gave us is the year of love. And it means, uh, the way God laid it out for me to lay out to the people, is that it is first redemptive. Amen. You all know this by now. Y'all be able to teach this part. It's redemptive. That means we understand and recognize what Christ did for us on the cross. Secondly, it is relentless. relentless. All right? It's relentless. That means it doesn't stop. It doesn't quit. It doesn't give up. Finally, it's real. That means it's authentic. And we've been walking through this year of love, teaching different messages, uh, sermons, and Bible study uh, throughout the year. And we had kind of taken a break from it. And so beginning at the, at, at the month of June, we resumed teaching on love. Uh, and I talked about love and sacrifice first Sunday. Then we talked about love and freedom on the second Sunday. On last Sunday, we talked about walk in love. And, and today we're talking about love and discipline. Now I'm going to spend a little bit more time developing discipline because we've spent a good bit of time talking about love. And love, uh, discipline rather, is a noun and a verb. But I'm going to go with verb because that's how it's used in today's text. And a verb that means to train by instruction and exercise. Uh -huh. To drill. Yeah. Somebody say to drill. To, drill. Uh -huh. to bring to a state of order and obedience by training and control may involve penalty or punishment. Here, Control does not mean manipulation. And penalty, penalty and punishment do not excuse abuse. Make sure you know the difference. Now from the spiritual context, the word discipline derives from the Latin root word desire, which means to learn. Specifically, discipline comes from the Latin word discipline. Disciplinia, which means instruction and training. From the same root word comes the word discipulus, which translates today into the word we say disciple. Everybody say disciple. disciple. And that word means student. Now most people conflate a disciple of Christ with a follower of Christ. And I must be honest, I'm guilty of that. But when I was getting ready for this message, I learned something myself. Yeah. And when I looked at the Latin root of this word, to be a disciple of Christ is not the same thing to be a follower of Christ. People followed him and got the two fish and five loaves. But the disciples are the ones who are students of Christ. And again, from that same Latin word, we get Disciplina, uh, disciplinia, which is instruction and training. Here's the essential thought. The root word of learning, to learn, desire. It involves input, that's the instruction and teaching, and output. One becomes a student. Even from the same word discernment that we don't find exactly worded in the Bible, but discernment is given uh, except for a few times in the New Testament for example, 1 Corinthians 12 but you don't see the word discernment very often, but what we have translated into discernment comes from this same word, and even discernment means that you are a student the input, that's the instruction and training, and then the output you become a student, student of who? the Holy Ghost you see that? Desire, that same Latin word shows up in discipline, disciple, discernment. Information is an auto, it doesn't automatically make you a teacher. Sharing information doesn't automatically make you a teacher. And showing up doesn't make you a student. Tell Lord, thank you. Come on, tell Lord, thank you. It won't be so hard if you say amen. Just because you show up doesn't make you a student. Can I get a witness? Anybody ever did that? You showed up to school, but you weren't a student that day. You showed up. 
You didn't want him to call nobody and tell him he wasn't there. So you showed up physically. Okay. I guess everybody here is on the, from the National Honor Society. <laughs> Maybe I got a church full of beta clubs. In this. Glory to God. But there's a difference between a pupil and a student. An attendant and a student. Learning, therefore, requires active participation on both ends. If you want to have desire, you have to want it for yourself. That's learning. If you want to have desire or learning, you have to want it for yourself. I am taking my time to build this word called discipline so we don't mess it up. Could it be? That our discipleship is a reflection of our discipline. Could it be that the quality of our discipleship, our ability to follow Christ, has a lot to do with our discipline and our willingness to learn from the Lord? Discipline nor discipleship is not dogma, it's not legalism, but it is instruction teaching and guidance that cultivates a personal pursuit of improvement. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm trying to help us understand. Yeah, that's it. it is teaching, instruction, and guidance that cultivates a personal pursuit of improvement. Let me say it another way. If I want to cultivate discipline in someone, let's use for example my children. Remember I said learning has to be active engagement on both ends. Yeah. Right. So that means I'm putting it out, but they got to receive it. Yeah. 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 And the only way that they become disciplined is not just because words came out of my mouth. Right. Yeah. Is, is that true or not? Yeah. But what, make, what gives them discipline ultimately is the instruction, the teaching, and the guidance that I give them that cultivates on the inside of them a personal pursuit. A personal desire to be better. Yeah, yeah. And when you think about discipline that way, you don't think about it as something that happens to you. You think about discipline and discipline is something that happens for you. There's a difference. You feel like disciplining, whether it's from man or from God, is to, to cramp your style. To block you from living your best life. You're going to struggle so these type of messages are hard for people who unknowingly or conveniently misunderstand discipline to avoid accountability. Y'all know people like that? Yeah. You purposely <laughs> or conveniently or unknowingly in some cases, you, you misconstrue what disciplining means because what you really want to do is avoid accountability. Let me share with you four lessons on discipline. So you can get to your pole chops. <laughs> <laughs> discipline. Four lessons on discipline. Discipline indicates love. That's the first lesson. Discipline indicates love. We're in Hebrews, Hebrews 12, 5, and 6. And if you have forgotten the ex and you have forgotten the exhortation, which speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Discipline indicates love. In other words, I demonstrate my love for you by exerting discipline toward you. And this is actually a reflection of Proverbs 3, 11 through 12. For those who need to be reminded, the New Testament echoes and reflects much of what the Old Testament has said. The New Testament, again, echoes or reflects much of what the Old Testament has said. And this is another example. The Hebrew writer is literally quoting Proverbs 3, 11 and 12. And so this is the second time these 
this, this concept shows up in the word of God, this time in the New Testament. And he's showing you that discipline indicates love. Now let me spend a little time on love. Love, as we have said over and over and over again, is a commitment that leads to sacrifice. Love is something that is demonstrated. And when you think about it that way, it actually makes sense to those of us who have been placed in a position to discipline anyone. Because the discipline, the disciplining, which is what I'm exerting uh, toward someone, is really a reflection of my love. And my love is a commitment to you that leads me to sacrifice for you. Amen. So on the, on the back end of that disciplining, as a child, I often felt like you were just lording over me. But now that I'm on the front end, or maybe I should have said that was the front end, now that I'm on the back end of that, I understand that it costs the discipliner just as much as the disciplinee. Amen. Amen. Now, now all the young people, I know y'all y'all, probably don't believe that. Mama say, daddy say, that hurt me as much as it hurt you. You're thinking, <laughs> See, what I realized is that the pain that my mother said when she said, that hurt me, but I still got a whipping, I still got a punishment. And she said, that hurt me, just like it hurt you. I, I was only keeping that in the vein of the physical. Yes. Ain't nobody put a belt across your behind, <laughs> so you can't be hurting like me. But what I realize is in disciplining me, she's also reflecting on the love she has for me and all of the commitment she has toward me that makes her sacrifice for me. Yeah. And I still won't line up. Amen. That hurts. Yes. That hurts. Yes. And if you want to know hurt, you look at somebody that you've invested time and you've been committed to. You try your best to make sure they are their best. Yes. And they cannot appreciate it even with the simple obedience and submission to your expectation. Yes, sir. That hurts. Yes, sir. I'm trying to help us. Yes, but discipline reflects love. Yes, I love you enough to make sure you are in line. Yes, I love you enough to call you my own. Yes. I love you enough to continue being committed to you even when you are inconsistent. Yes. And that is <clears throat> what God does for us. Mm -hmm. Think it not strange that a few weeks ago we went to Ephesians 5 where the Bible says be ye followers uh, which meant imitators of Christ as dear children because we're all children uh, of God when we align to the word of God. Amen. And when he disciplines us, that is an indication that he loves us. Amen. Just for a reminder, verse 6 of Hebrews 12 says, For the Lord loves those that he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. And that's not always physical. Some of us, some of us wish that's all we got from the Lord. Just to lay across the bed and get a little whipping with a switch, we would take that. Yeah. Yeah. See, some of us, they got some, we done got some supernatural, spiritual whippings. Yeah. And that's all it was, we would take that. But have, have any of you all ever been put in time out by God? Yeah. But what I'm telling you is thank God for the chastening. Yeah. Yeah. Because the chastening is a reminder that he loves you. Yeah. Yeah. So even when you don't feel the hand of God on your life and favors all over you and you're living in abundance and flowing. <laughs> even when your life doesn't seem like it's lining up to everything you put down on your New Year's resolution. When you feel the chastening of the Lord. When you feel that punishment of the Lord. It is not to get revenge on you, by the way. Because you, you can't, God won't ever try to get even with you. You'd be taken out of here. He ain't trying to get even with you. The discipline is not God 
putting punishment on you, but allowing penalty to happen to you Amen. because you stepped out of alignment. God is doing this to me because I did this. Oh, this happened to me because I made this mistake. God ain't getting you. I'm really trying to help y'all. I know sometimes that's how we feel. Oh, this this happened to me because I've been I've been doing bad. No, you got yourself. Yeah. God ain't getting you. That's, that's not in his job description to get you. You get outside of his will and you can you didn't got God. And we're, we're some of us are afraid of an eternal hell, not realizing that hell is everywhere God ain't. living in hell right now. I feel like I'm living in hell. I feel like I'm catching hell. You better watch what you say. Because when you say that, you're, you're acknowledging God ain't nowhere around. Hell ain't possible in God's presence. Hell is not a possibility in God's presence. That's right. Love and discipline indicates love. Let's go to the second one. Discipline authenticates paternity. This one going to be good. It's going to be good. Discipline authenticates paternity. Do you know what paternity is? Do you know? Do y'all understand paternity? So we go back to Proverbs 13, 24. What's so good about reading the word of the Lord? I was reading Proverbs 13 and I said, okay, I'm gonna include that in the message. And I'm gonna include that in, in today's message. Got over to Hebrews and start finding and, and identifying the other scriptures, looked in the in the column and, and found out that Proverbs 13, 24 was a cross-reference to this same scripture. Again, I'm just being transparent with you to show you how studying the word of God is often cyclical. It leads you in very familiar patterns. So Proverbs 13, 24, let's read it again. He who spares the rod. Again, don't just think about a switch, a belt. Just in its form of disciplining. He who spares the rod hates, hates, hates his son, his child. But if you love him, you'll discipline him promptly. Amen. In the New English Bible, it says you would you would discipline him or her diligently. Oh, yeah. That means I don't ever tire of disciplining those that need to be disciplined. Yeah. You may get frustrated, you may get overwhelmed, but you don't tire. You are diligent. You are prompt about it. Prompt doesn't mean time. Prompt means timely. You see the difference? Because if you react to everything a person does that you have to discipline, you're inevitably going to make worse mistakes or poor decisions, should I say. Whether that's a parent to a child, a supervisor to an employer. Sometimes time or responding promptly doesn't mean you do it fast. You just do it in a timely fashion. Realizing that every every action out of alignment needs an appropriate response. And so then we get back to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 7 through 8. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as who? Sons. And a son, and what son is there that the father doesn't chasten? But if you are without chastening, you're illegitimate. You are an Ill illegitimate child, is what he's saying. You're not a son. So discipline authenticates paternity. Now, why did I use the word authenticate? Authenticate means to establish as genuine. Because originally I thought to call this discipline establishes paternity. But authenticate takes establishing a little bit further. When you establish, you just set it in place. But when you authenticate, you establish it as genuine. And how many of you know we need genuine fathers? Yes, sir. Amen. Discipline establishes paternity. Something else establishes fatherhood. 
fatherhood. <laughs> but in order to be a real father, there has to be an authentic commitment to discipline it. And you can't discipline something when there's no presence. You got to be present and accounted for. Now I'm saying paternity because the scripture says sons and father. But I could have easily said discipline authenticates parenthood. That's right. If you are a genuine parent, discipline is involved. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. If you are not a genuine parent, chaos mm -hmm. right. and confusion abound. Mm -hmm. yeah. When you, ask, when you ask that question, what I'm going to do with these children, I hope you're looking in the mirror. Because it starts with you. You should be disciplining children because you love them. But point number two tells us that that's actually what authenticates your parenthood. Not your biological connection to them. Not living in the same house. Not being eligible for a Mother's Day card or Father's Day card. What actually authenticates you as a parent is your ability to discipline them. Amen. Provide them alignment and order and congruence to the word of God. It's different again than simply establishing. That's why at the beginning of the Hebrews text today, Hebrews 12 and 5, the A part it says, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. Amen. So the Hebrew writer is saying, I'm speaking to you as a child. Mm -hmm. I want you to know there's a difference. And so let us make sure that our discipline is authenticated or our paternity is authenticated. Our parenthood, our maternity, however you want to refer to it, is authenticated by discipline. Yeah. Discipline is what is what, what we need. And again, discipline is a two-way street where there is training and instruction and there is a student involved. Amen. The greatest contribution you can make to society is to raise your child in the fear and admonition of the Lord. That's right. That's right. Amen. That's right. Amen. That's right. Amen. Maybe all y'all don't believe that or y'all wearing... Uh, no clapping masks. <laughs> I'm going to say that again. One of the best contributions, the best contribution, the best contribution you can make to society is to raise your child in the fear and admonition of the Lord. <laughs> you make sure, if, you, if, if, you, if, you, if you're doing this holistically now, you make sure they understand what healthy and functional relationships look like. Yeah. You make sure they understand the difference between different bank accounts and, and creating generational wealth and understand the market. You make sure they understand entrepreneurship. You make sure they understand culture. You make sure they understand their heritage and history. But you have better make sure that they know Christ. Yeah. Yeah. My children, no, no different than other children. I don't put anything past them. They want to be involved in different activities. But I'm not going to softball my child out of church. Amen. I'm not going to piano class my child out of church. I don't, it, 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 that, don't, that don't work here. Because, and see, I know, I know what some of you are thinking. Well, you know, it don't take all of that. And I, I, I mean, I, it's more than just coming to the church. But then, before I say that, uh, Sister Jana, I think about all the time my mama had me in church and all the devil and I still <laughs> so if we were just doing a, 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 a proposition you know a ratio here if all the church they put me in and I still got in what I got into what in the world are we doing when we don't give our children a fighting chance with a foundation I did a whole lot of stuff they didn't teach me. I can't put that on no generation of curse. I did it because I wanted to do it. Tell them all, thank you. Number three, discipline.
precedes respect and submission. Amen. Discipline precedes respect and submission. Hebrews 12, 9 and 10. It says, furthermore, or therefore, we have had human fathers who correct us. Who corrected us and we paid them respect. That's respect. Shall we not much more be readily in subjection? That's the submission. To the father of spirits and live. For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best. That's the loophole. As best to them. But he for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. Again, lesson number three. Discipline proceeds respect and submission. Discipline proceeds respect and submission. And the example they give us in verse 9 really confirms what I've already been saying. That human fathers, earthly fathers, are very, very important. Because they, they, they help build an understanding of a heavenly father. Yeah. So for all of the men here, I will say this. Whether you are a father now or you will be a father in the future, do not forget how critical your role is. Mm -hmm. Because some of the issues that people have with understanding the heavenly father are because of earthly fathers. Amen. Who don't know their role. And so, or don't understand it. Or maybe understand it but won't fulfill it. I don't have time to unpack that today. But I will just make sure you understand. The scripture is saying that when they corrected us, we paid them respect. Amen. We paid them respect. And respect just means we got in line. And then it gives that loophole saying uh, in verse 10, they chastened us as what seemed best for them. That means daddy and mama, they make mistakes. Do y'all hear that, young people? Your mama and your daddy make mistakes. Your mother, your father, anyone who's had a hand in raising you, they have made mistakes. Now, you're not one of them. I know what you're, I know what you're not one of them. You came from God. You might have been unplanned, but you came from God. But we do make mistakes yet. Yeah. And if we tell you the truth, sometimes there are ways that we discipline you and we think about it later and we say that was not the way to do that. Yeah, that's right. that's right. Even if we have too much pride to come back and apologize. Yeah, right. I'm just going to tell the truth. Yeah. But as you grow and mature, you realize my child needs to see the transparency yeah. of parenthood. Yeah. Right. If I made a mistake, I need to tell my child yeah. I made a mistake. Yeah. I'm sorry for the way I was talking to you. Because you yeah. carry the attitude out on them because folks at the word workplace yeah. peeved you off. Yeah. But what the scripture is saying, I pulled out a little of verse 9 and a little of verse 10 to show you that it cultivated respect when parents, when fathers, when mothers, when they discipline us, the Bible says we gave them respect. So then he says, shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the father? But here is the best part of this, this point, you all. It says be subjection or submission to the Father and, what's the next word? Live. Yeah, live. And then I had to think about that. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait a minute. So if, if, if I gave respect to my earthly parents, how much more can I submit to the instruction of my heavenly Father and live? So that, that helps us understand that when God is disciplining us, it's really not about taking something away from you as much as it is protecting you so you can go forth and live. But if you look at discipline as something that's holding you back, you will miss the benefits of the kingdom. What did Jesus tell the disciples? He said in Mark 8, he says, if you save your life, you'll lose it. But if you lose your life, for my sake and the gospels, the same shall he live. That means if you are willing to put yourself behind the cross, if you're trying to, if you're willing to put your opinions behind the cross, behind what you want to do and your preferences, you will get everything you want anyway. But you got to put the priority in place. Matthew 6.33, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. What is your thing? Cars are a thing. 
Relationships are a thing. Houses are things. Raises on your job are things. But God wants to bless you with more than things. You just got to submit and live. If we saw it that way, submit and live. I'm not submitting to God because my life is going to become a square. I'm submitting to God because it will actually make my life more fulfilling. I know all of us don't believe that. That's why some of us struggle to line up to the word. But really what we're doing is we're struggling to line up to the word because we know it's going to get rid of things we want to do. That's just the truth. But if you really understood the scripture, disciplining yourself according to the word of God doesn't take anything from your life that's in the will. And it's stuff that we don't want to get rid of that's, that's not in the will. So then we reject the whole truth. My Lord. Here is my point. Structure ain't never hurt nobody. I know that's bad English, but this, this is bad. Structure ain't never hurt nobody. When I was going to the bowling alley as a, as a younger child, I really enjoyed going. Because in my mind, I was a winner. I was a winner. I always won. But, but maybe around the age of eight or nine, I realized that what they were really doing were lifting the rails <laughs> in the gutter. I would roll the ball and I would see it go to the left and I thought it was going back to the middle because I was doing my head like this. And I said, oh man, I did good this time. But really there were rails in the gutter. Do you know that's what discipline is? That's what good parenting is. You might not bowl a strike, but you won't be a gutter ball. <laughs> That's what you're trying to do for your children. That's what God is trying to do for you. You might not, you may not roll a strike. You might not even roll a spare. Yeah. But I guarantee you won't be a gutter ball. <laughs> Thank God he put the rails up. Yeah. Thank God he put the rails up. And the reason that they put the rails up is so that you can go further. Yeah. Because if they didn't put the rails up, you'd end up in the gutter and come up in the head. Yeah. And that's just how the discipline of God works. There are rails in the gutter yeah. that's stopping you from coming up in the head. Yeah. And when you hit the rail, it might bump you. Yeah. It might be hard. It might bounce you. Yeah. That's what discipline does. But eventually you won't stay in the lane and get to where you But God is calling all of us to structure. Let me give you the final point. Discipline produces the fruit of righteousness. We see it at the end of verse 10, which was with our previous point. For he is our prophet that we may be partakers of his holiness. That's an indication of the fruit. Look at verse 11 and we'll close it. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. That's that gutter ball. But painful. Nevertheless, after when it yields a peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Tell the Lord thank you. Thank you Lord. This scripture gives you more information or gives you even more context when you read it in the Amplified Bible. Yes. The Bible says, Hebrews 12 and 11, for the time being no discipline brings joy. Is that true? Right. It, but it seems sad and painful yet to those who have been trained by it. Afterward, it yields a peaceable fruit of righteousness. Yes. Right standing with God in a lifestyle and an attitude that seeks conformity to God's will and purpose. Yeah. I'm here to tell you that when you are in committed to discipline that comes from Jesus Christ, yeah. you're not losing anything, but you're gaining a holy and yeah. a reasonable life. Yeah. Yeah. What do I mean 
talking about reasonable. Reasonable as in Hebrews 12 and 1, your reasonable service. Yeah. Meaning you may not always get it right. You may not dot all of your I's. Yeah. You may not cross all of yeah. your T's. Yeah. But when you commit to the discipline that comes from the Lord, yeah. you Lord. will hit the ball more than you strike out. Yeah. Yeah. That's all. That's all. That's all. That's all that we need to, to do. That's all we need to commit to doing. And then discipline produces that fruit of righteousness. Yeah. Somebody say fruit, fruit. of righteousness. Oh, right. That's what discipline does for yeah. us. It produces a, some fruit in us. That means eventually uh, people should see the manifestation of this walk you say you have with God. Yeah. Yeah, that's the reason that somebody don't believe you is they don't see the fruit. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, you will know the tree by the fruit it bears. Walking around telling folk you're an apple and you look like a kiwi. Telling folk you're a banana but you smell like an orange. Yeah, but when you are disciplined in the things of God, you produce the fruit that comes from God. And the fruit of God, according to the Hebrew writer, is a life that's whole. A life that's righteous. What we need to do is get committed to the things of God. What did I say? We need to get committed to the things of God. It might seem difficult, but you gotta keep on moving. It might seem inconvenient, but you gotta keep on moving. We need more will be consistent. Let me say it again. Be consistent. One of the reasons that our young people struggle is because they look at adults and your walk with Christ is nothing more than a random collection of experiences. That's all they ever see. Sometimes you're up. Sometimes you're down. Sometimes you're in. Sometimes you're out. Sometimes you got a word of edification. Sometimes you're laced with profanity. Sometimes you're in your Bible. And sometimes you all need other things. I know what some of y'all are thinking. I'm just going to be real. And I want you to be real. But somewhere around the corner, you can be real with your child and say, baby, Mama ain't feeling too good today. Daddy ain't feeling too good today. I'm struggling in my faith today. But you got to get to the butt. But I trust God. That's all I'm saying. You can tell your children I ain't been feeling my best. I don't really feel like praying right now. I don't feel like going to church right now. But I trust God. The people at my job getting on my nerves. The people on my job are pulling me out of my character. But I trust God. And I know I got to pay bills so you can keep on eating. Tell the Lord, thank you. Tell the Lord, thank you. Let it not be said of us that we're I put myself on the 
if I can tell the truth in my life, I rejected discipline because I was convinced it was something else. Lift your hands all over the sanctuary and ask the Lord to show you the areas in your life where you can be more disciplined. I don't know what it is, but honestly, it ain't really my business. It's not my business, it's yours.
And uh, we also have our Kingdom Care for our youngest. They're meeting at 6 p.m. this Wednesday via Zoom uh, for their show and tell part two. But we won't have Bible study here Wednesday, okay? And then, um, let's not forget Saturday, we'll be, be, be back here for consecration prayer in the sanctuary of our conference call. Amen. Thank God one more time for our young people. Let's give them a hand. Sunday for another awesome worship experience, Communion Sunday. Amen. Y'all pray for me. I don't know what the last couple of Sundays, my voice is going, going out on me. When I get up here, I don't know what's going on. And then I still get tuned up. This is, this is not necessarily how I plan it, but I thank God for giving me at least the love and commitment for his word and teaching it to all of you. It's the joy of my heart to share the word of the Lord. Stand all over the house. Stand all over the house. Lord, thank you for this great opportunity you've given us to assemble and to learn and grow from your word. And Lord, let the word of God that has gone forth penetrate our hearts, marinate there, that we can share it with other people. Lord, we thank you for every person who's here, those who are streaming in. We ask that you would bless the seeds that we sow into this ministry. We sow into this ministry because we believe in this ministry. And we're looking for you to take us higher than ever before. And now give us grace and traveling mercy as we go to our various destinations and bring us back at the appointed time. Amen. Before we close out with our declaration, I just want to remind each of you that we're asking you this. We've been doing this all the month of June, but we're going to start transitioning in July to be prayerful and thoughtful. I want to keep saying it again and again that the Lord has been favorable upon Grace Covenant. We have closed on 3.55 acres of land that we are owners of. We've been working with the land, tilling it. We've been uh, grading it. We're getting ready to put some signage out. Uh, but, we, but we still have a lot of work to do, and that's going to require our collective commitment. And so we're asking you to be prayerful about what you can contribute. We, we have a three-year plan a three-year plan of a capital campaign, and we will do it the way we've done everything else here over these eight plus years with the help of the Lord. Amen? So you sow into this ministry knowing you're sowing into good ground, and we're good stewards of it, and God has been showing us the fruit of our stewardship. Lifting it up, this is my seed. I want it to go, grow, and come back. Good vision. Press down. Shake it together and run it over. Now say, see, I'll see you soon. Amen. You may give and you are dismissed. They will come down the side aisles with the baskets.